Hello, everyone, and welcome to our IVF webinar. I hope you had a wonderful weekend and are ready to learn a bit more, find out a bit more on our topic tonight. Definitely interesting one, still a new topic, which is double simulation protocols. And we have our special guest and special expert who will explain all about this. Uh, this is Dr. Daniel Baudry. You can see him right here. Hello, Dr. Daniel. How are you feeling? It's great to have you back. Hello, good evening. Uh, thank you, Caroline, for the introduction. I'm looking forward to, to this interesting topic. Definitely. As I've mentioned, this is something that uh, we are still exploring new experimental topics. Of course, uh, last week we had some already, and now we will continue with that. And let me just mention that Dr. Daniel Baudry, he is the gynecologist at Ivy of Spain, which is located in Alicante. So it's another team member from uh, from, uh, from IV of Spain. So we are always happy to have you on board. And if you've seen some of the previous webinar with Dr. Baudry, I'm sure you know that that it's going to be definitely interesting and definitely well explained, no doubt here. So thank you so much, Dr. Baudry, for joining us tonight. And remember that, as always, we will start with the presentation. However, afterwards, it will be time for your questions. Just put those in the chat section and Dr. Baudry will definitely answer them for you. And before we start with the presentation, let me just add that, as you know, we are here almost every single day from Monday to Friday, simply because we are here to support you, to educate you, to provide you with different topics on various, um, various of course, uh, topics focused on IVF, egg donation treatment, but many, many others. As you know, there were some emotional support topics about emotional supports, etc. And uh, my IV offenses is a part of European Fertility Society, which has been brought to you because we definitely are here to support all the patients uh, in any way we can. And that will be it from me. And let's get going with our presentation. Then. Thank you, Caroline, uh, for the kind introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be invited by uh, my IVF answers uh, again uh, to hold uh, this uh, webinar on the topic of uh, double ovarian stimulation. Uh, double ovarian stimulation or, or dual steam is a novel uh, approach, as, as Caroline uh, mentioned, uh, that could be especially useful for poor prognosis patients, especially those with a low ovarian reserve. So I see that there are quite a lot of uh, participants already, so let's uh, start. Um, before starting a quick uh, self-introduction, uh, I was trained in assisted reproduction in, in France and, and Spain and um, obtained a PhD and an MSc from the universities of Barcelona and uh, Leeds uh, respectively. I had uh, quite a um, international uh, working experience by working in, in France, Spain, uh, Japan, and the UK. And uh, my clinical and research interests are mainly egg donation, uh, the embryo transfer procedure, and also innovative uh, ovarian stimulation protocols, including mild uh, ovarian stimulation and natural cycle, and also uh, 3D ultrasound. So this is the outline of, of today's uh, um, uh, topic. Basically, I would like to talk a little bit about the background of uh, briefly uh, ovarian uh, stimulation and ovarian physiology. Then we would discuss uh, who are the best patients for the dual steam uh, approach. Then I would like to explain in detail uh, how the double ovarian stimulation is conducted with some uh, practical uh, details too. And then we could uh, discuss pros and cons of uh, this uh, approach. And at the end, I would like to uh, show a few studies, uh, relevant studies uh, that were published uh, so far. So mm -hmm. let's start. Basically, uh, a few words are necessary uh, about ovarian physiology and uh, the whole concept of ovarian uh, stimulation. I'm sure that you're quite familiar with it, but still uh, it's worth uh, explaining that uh, the development of ovarian follicles uh, is a quite a relatively long process, uh, up to 120 days. And there's a first phase here when the microscopic uh, primordial uh, follicles develop into into larger uh, follicles. This phase is not sensitive to 
to hormones uh, of stimulation. Whereas uh, from the moment that there are some small uh, so-called enteral follicles that could be seen uh, on an ultrasound scan, the follicles become sensitive uh, to gonadotropin, so to the hormones that we administer during ovarian stimulation, and they could be matured uh, up until a mature size of up to uh, two uh, centimeters. So, <clears throat> Until uh, relatively recently, um, it was thought that during a menstrual cycle, uh, there was uh, like one wave of developing uh, small enteral uh, follicles uh, and uh, the ovarian stimulation usually started uh, with the onset of the menstrual period when this wave uh, was uh, was there and follicles were uh, ready to be stimulated. Recently, however, uh, the research of Berwald and, and colleagues uh, have uh, suggested that uh, there are more than one uh, follicular waves. Actually, uh, here we can see there could be two uh, or even three uh, follicular waves during uh, the same menstrual cycle in, in some women. So um, this allows uh, the, this uh, kind of approach of double ovarian stimulation to take advantage of more than one uh, follicular uh, wave. Another recent development which allowed uh, the development and, and the spread of, of um, this innovative protocol is the appearance of highly efficient uh, oocyte and embryo vitrification. So since the early 2000s, this uh, method was developed and uh, it became uh, very efficient. And uh, this uh, also led to the uh, strategy of uh, oocyte and embryo accumulation or, or banking, which in many advanced clinic now is a standard approach. Practically the number of so-called freeze-all cycles when the embryos are not transferred in a fresh cycle, but rather frozen uh, to for embryo banking purposes or, or for pre-implantation genetic testing is, is more uh, frequent. And uh, later uh, a suitable embryo or a genetically tested embryo could be uh, transferred uh, in a delayed frozen embryo transfer cycle. So I would like to uh, call your attention to this interesting graph from uh, the publication of uh, Sunkara and colleagues. So this uh, registry-based uh, data set uh, from the UK uh, asked the question, uh, what is the best number of eggs uh, to achieve like optimal chances of live birth? And it turned out to be around uh, 15. So basically, uh, as the number of eggs, uh, available eggs increases during uh, an ovarian stimulation, it could be one cycle or several cycles, the chances of achieving a live birth also increases. And I would like to sh uh, call your attention to this steep part of this graph. So basically, uh, especially for a low responder patient, there's a big difference if one, two, three, four, five, six, seven egg eggs uh, are, are obtained because the chances of achieving a live birth uh, increasing uh, quite quickly. So this is the rationale why uh, it is a good idea to repeat uh, stimulation cycles, even back to back as with a double uh, ovarian stimulation approach. And uh, in this, uh, with this approach, obtain a higher uh, chances of, of pro progress. So um, this led to the development of these non-conventional start uh, stimulation protocols, meaning that stimulation uh, could not only be started at the beginning of a, a menstrual cycle, but also uh, in the luteal phase after ovulation happens, so in the second phase of the ovarian stimulation, or uh, at random, independently from the stage of the menstrual cycle. This is especially useful for urgent fertility preservation, or this uh, sort of double ovarian stimulation approach was developed, which means that a conventional follicular phase or, or early, uh, the first phase of the menstrual cycle is used for the first stimulation and then immediately back to back uh, with a small uh, 
very small pause, immediately a second stimulation is started in the luteal phase. So this was the so-called uh, Shanghai Protocol, which was first published in 2014. Then uh, also uh, an Italian group became very active with this uh, protocol and published uh, many interesting uh, papers, uh, the group of uh, Filippo Baldi. And uh, nowadays more and more clinics adopt uh, this approach in Spain, in Scandinavia, and the US and elsewhere. And uh, we have more and more uh, accumulating uh, data. So for whom this approach uh, could be considered? Uh, obviously, the primary uh, indication or the most suitable patients are poor responders, those who have low ovarian reserve markers, meaning that uh, uh, either, for example, they have uh, on a scan a low number of these uh, small antral follicles, these kind of black spots uh, could be seen. These are tiny envelopes containing potentially an egg that measure between two to nine millimeters. These could be evaluated with an ultrasound. So the total number of these follicles uh, between the two ovaries are, are less than five or uh, also the level of the antimullerian hormone could predict ovarian response. So these patients have a low uh, threshold of uh, antimullerian hormone. So these patients, uh, which are now with a <clears throat> recent classification are called the uh, Poseidon group three or four patients, depending on their age, whether they are a little bit younger, less than 35 or older, more than 35. But these patients have a low ovarian reserve markers and the number of expected eggs is uh, three or less, uh, even with a successful stimulation. So these uh, patients could benefit from back-to-back uh, -back stimulation cycles. However, uh, it doesn't mean that those patients who have uh, practically uh, completely exhausted ovarian reserve, uh, almost uh, um, with uh, premature ovarian failure, these patients are not good candidates because even uh, with any uh, stimulation approach, if eggs are not retrieved, then there's not too much point of doing back-to-back -back, uh, stimulation cycles. So a second group of patients that is also... Uh, suitable uh, to uh, consider this uh, double ovarian stimulation. Uh, this could be, uh, we could call uh, secondary indications, are um, patients who um, want to do pre-implantation genetic screening. Of course, often, often these patients are have advanced maternal age and have the same problem of low ovarian reserve. So probably they would not produce a high amount of eggs. Or for example, older, older uh, social egg freezers in their late 30s or, or even 40s. Also, this is not the ideal age to do egg freezing, but we have this kind of request. So these patients also would benefit from uh, doing back-to-back -back cycles. Or, for example, cross-border reproductive care patients. So in our clinic, for example, we have many uh, such patients. And simply for logistical reasons, these patients could benefit in performing back-to-back -back cycles because they don't have to uh, travel back to their home country and could do uh, practically a stimulation uh, during a, a one-month period. Also, another interesting clinical group of patients, uh, these cycle rescue patients, meaning that uh, for um, any uh, reason, uh, the first uh, stimulation attempt yielded a suboptimal ovarian response. So according to the new uh, Poseidon classification, these are patients uh, Poseidon group one and two. So these are younger or older patients, but without any low, uh, so not, they don't have any low ovarian reserve markers, but still for some reason, maybe in adequate dosing or other issues, they did produce a low amount of eggs, less than four eggs. So although this is a quite uh, <clears throat> this um, discouraging uh, event, uh, these cycles, the first stimulation uh, could be uh, compensated if immediately a second uh, stimulation attempt started and uh, a better amount of eggs could be retrieved. So, Basically, in these patients, the objective is to obtain, uh, as in the first group two, a higher number of eggs uh, during a shorter uh, time period. Uh, but who are the patients, for example, who are not really suitable candidates? These are uh, definitely high responder patients. We will uh, analyze this why. Basically, uh, high responder patients uh, um, 
are not suitable candidates because with the dual steam approach uh, during the second phase, it's much more difficult to do their monitoring. Often um, there are more eggs retrieved during the second cycle and for a patient who already produced uh, quite uh, a high amount of eggs, this is not uh, a good approach because this could increase the risk of uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome and even if there's no OHSS, then uh, cause increased uh, discomfort. A third group of uh, potential patients are uh, those who need urgent fertility preservation for a medical indication, mostly uh, because of uh, recent diagnosis of cancer. So for these patients, it is uh, very important uh, to do uh, to retrieve as many eggs as possible during a short time period and uh, quickly. So before administering chemo or radiotherapy, these patients could benefit from a dual steam approach. Even recently, a so-called triple stimulation uh, was uh, described uh, for uh, such a patient. Obviously, this only is, could be allowed for really uh, well-selected and motivated patients. Now let's talk a little bit about um, how the double ovarian stimulation is uh, conducted. So obviously before choosing the adequate stimulation protocol for any patient, it is important to uh, perform a thorough ovarian reserve uh, testing. So as mentioned, this could be done uh, with an ultrasound test. So this is a picture of an ovary and we could see that uh, there are some three uh, tiny follicles of, of different sizes. So this is a, a low uh, count of follicles for this ovary. Also, we could uh, do a test of the antimalarian hormone levels. And if we have a level of uh, below 1.2, then the suspicion of uh, um, poor response is, is uh, quite high. So basically this patient, even with a successful stimulation, might produce uh, three or less eggs. If you look at uh, potential stimulation protocols, then um, these are just the two uh, main uh, possible stimulation protocols. But if, if you're interested in, in different ovarian stimul stimulation protocols, I would encourage you uh, in two days time, uh, sorry, no, in three days time on, on Thursday to check out another webinar uh, that I will be conducting about uh, stimulation drugs and ovarian stimulation protocols. So <clears throat> basically, um, a couple of years back or, or since even earlier, uh, one of the main protocols was the so-called the long agonist protocol, uh, where the whole duration of the treatment could be three to four weeks. Nowadays, uh, however, and then in recent years, uh, practically most of the clinic have switched to the GnRH antagonist protocol. This is the so-called short protocol. So <clears throat> conducted with uh, stimulation drugs and the GnRH antagonist to prevent ovulation. So basically uh, the double ovarian stimulation protocol, the scheme is here, could be conducted with such a GnRH uh, antagonist uh, uh, protocol. So stimulation is started uh, as a conventional uh, follicular phase stimulation from, from the beginning of a menstrual period, from day two, three, after a baseline scan to check the number of follicles. Stimulation usually is conducted uh, with a personalized dose, but usually not exceeding uh, 300 units. Daily injections, a course of injections that could last maybe uh, 9, 10, 11, 12 days, a little bit less than two weeks. Afterwards, uh, in the second half uh, of, the, of the stimulation, the GnRH antagonist injections are added too to prevent the growing follicles from ovulating. Then when uh, at the end of the stimulation, the size of the follicles is adequate. So we have uh, reached uh, mature follicles uh, up to two centimeters then, and triggering agent is administered, most often uh, a GnRH agonist uh, short-acting trigger. And uh, 36 hours later, uh, an egg collection is performed as, as usual. 
So the eggs that are retrieved from the stimulation, there are two things uh, that could happen. Uh, in many clinics, um, eggs are submitted to the whole IVF lab procedure, meaning that mature eggs will be fertilized and then uh, embryo culture is done, usually until the blastocyst stage. And um, in some cases, even uh, trophoectoderm biopsy is performed uh, for those patients who need pre-implantation genetic screening. So this is one approach. Other clinics uh, have chosen to, uh, at this stage, to freeze the obtained eggs, so not to fertilize them, but rather to freeze them in order to um, avoid the additional costs of the IVF procedure because these uh, frozen eggs could be used uh, at the second stimulation could be thawed and two weeks later practically to use them together uh, with uh, the fresh eggs that were will be retrieved from the second uh, stage of the stimulation. But let's go back to the duostim protocol. So after the first egg collection, there's a very short gap that could vary between uh, zero to five days, usually two to three days, and stimulation is restarted, usually with the same kind of drug, same kind of protocol, same dose. Often the stimulation uh, could be a few days longer, and after uh, 11, 12, 13 days, again, a maturity, uh, mature follicles uh, are obtained. Basically, what happens during the second phase, obviously, obviously, hormonally, it's a completely different cycle from the first phase because uh, at the beginning, at least, there are still follicles, the punctured follicles from the first egg collection. These follicles diminish in size and are outgrown by uh, tiny new follicles which is the confirmation that uh, definitely there is a second uh, follicular wave or a, or a continuous follicular waves that could be uh, taken advantage of. So the gr new growing follicles uh, outgrow the, the uh, older follicles. And at the end, uh, often we have the same kind of picture that we would have at the end of the first stimulation. A new triggering agent is administered and uh, second egg collection is performed. Obviously, what is very important to uh, mm -hmm. mention that uh, after this double stimulation, the endometrial lining is not adequate um, and have been uh, too, uh, I mean, have been through too much to, to, to perform a fresh embryo transfer. So it is mandatory to freeze the embryos and uh, the embryos often submitted to pre-implantation genetic screening are used later at the later stage at the convenient uh, time uh, to do a frozen embryo uh, transfer. Egg collection, practically, there's no big difference between the egg collection after the first or the second stimulation. Some authors uh, have uh, had concerns maybe that the egg collection after the second, uh, for the second time is more uh, difficult, but uh, in our clinical experience is, uh, is, or could be more risky, but in our clinical experience, it is not usually the case. So, as mentioned, uh, vitrification uh, at the egg stage or, or most often at the embryo stage is necessary. And uh, fortunately, we have now the very efficient uh, vitrification method often performed with the uh, so-called uh, Kitazato um, 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 vitrification uh, method from Japan, which allows uh, like a very um, consistent and high rate of survival for embryos. It could reach up to 95, 97%. So what are the risks and side effects of an ovarian stimulation? Uh, there's no, there's not a big difference in terms of uh, side effects of conventional uh, one-phase stimulation or the two-phase or the double ovarian stimulation. Obviously, there would be some uh, common uh, side effects uh, related to the growth of the follicles and hormonal symptoms like lower abdominal discomfort, swelling, liquid retention, weight gain, breast tenderness, or mood swings. This is maybe at least the physical symptoms are uh, less important if the patient is a low responder patient because there are simply less growing follicles. Um, the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation uh, syndrome uh, could be greatly diminished if uh, a short-acting uh, 
triggering agent is used, which in this case uh, could be perfectly done. Also, if the patient uh, does not produce many eggs, this risk is low. There's a small risk of having an intra-abdominal bleeding uh, after an, any egg collection, but this is, is very uh, small, 0.1%, and usually could be managed uh, conservatively. Uh, today, there's no uh, like uh, any data on um, any negative effects on future fertility or ovarian reserve of doing uh, repeating several stimulation cycles or back-to-back -back stimulations or a demonstrated cancer risk, for example. But it's true that the number of uh, patients submitted to double ovarian stimulation is still relatively low and safety data is, is limited. So let's talk a little bit about pros and cons of, of this approach. This is a... Um, very interesting uh, SWOT analysis, strengths, uh, weaknesses, uh, opportunities and threats from the Italian group that has published a lot uh, about uh, double ovarian stimulation. Obviously, the main uh, advantage is that a higher number of embryos obtained from two stimulations compared to one stimulation only. So this is uh, self-explanatory. Uh, um, and in consequence, uh, more patients uh, could obtain a, a suitable blastocyst or even a blastocyst that is uh, genetically tested. By the way, um, if you're interested, uh, these authors uh, have proven and other authors too that there's no difference uh, in terms of egg quality or embryo quality uh, in double ovarian stimulation if you compare the first uh, part of the stimulation with the second part. So the egg quality uh, is the same. Uh, the main uh, opportunity with this kind of approach, of course, the reduced dropout rate because those patients who manage to complete double ovarian stimulation uh, are by definition have performed uh, two cycles. So they, they have 0% of dropout rate. So this uh, could be uh, considered uh, uh, an important uh, benefit. And uh, of course, this may also means that uh, the time to obtain a competent embryo is, is, is shorter. But as mentioned, there are also some weaknesses or unknown effect seals. So there's uh, not too many data on, on randomized cl uh, clinical trials or cost-effectiveness analysis, or for example, uh, what is the experience of, of patients themselves in, ter in terms of treatment burden. So, and also like safety data uh, is still uh, lacking uh, because uh, simply there are very few uh, studies uh, published uh, yet, methodologically uh, thorough studies. Benefits uh, of, the, of, the, of this approach. Uh, so uh, in many studies, uh, although not in all of them, but uh, sometimes more eggs are retrieved in the second phase. So this is, uh, could be clinically an important benefit. Probably it is related uh, maybe uh, to a carryover effect of the stimulation drug that have been used in the first phase. And uh, often uh, some eggs more, uh, some more eggs could be retrieved in the second phase compared to the first one. And obviously in low responder patients, even one or two more eggs uh, could uh, mean a, a big difference. So there's less dropout as uh, I have mentioned, but uh, this is of course obvious if two uh, cycles are done back to back. But there are also some drawbacks. So in terms of uh, for the clinic, uh, the workload is, is higher because two stimulations are done uh, to egg collections in, in one month's time. And the monitoring of the second phase is slightly more uh, difficult. Usually uh, it's better to rely on hormone measurements than uh, on the scan picture, at least at the beginning. And uh, as mentioned, uh, there's still uh, not too much data, especially from randomized clinical trials. So um, there's definitely an interest in double ovarian stimulations. As Caroline has mentioned also, it's uh, something uh, quite new and, and relatively experimental, although many clinics are doing it, but we should not think that this approach is uh, uh, the best solution for, for any, any type of uh, patient. So I would like to briefly show you some uh, published data, which could be interesting. 
there are increasing number of studies, but many of them are still uh, retrospective and, and definitely uh, I'm not aware of, of uh, too many uh, randomized uh, clinical trials. So this is an interesting uh, data set from uh, the Italian group that has a large experience with this approach. So they have uh, studied uh, some three, almost 300 patients who were Bologna poor responders, meaning that they had low ovarian reserve and were expected to have a low number of eggs uh, after stimulation and consequently low uh, live birth rate. So uh, double ovarian stimulation was proposed to these 300 patients, 100 of them are expected. Uh, accepted the, the, the approach and they have performed uh, on this infogram, one could see the first phase and the second phase of the stimulation. And this shows the end results per, per started cycle. So basically, although 69% of them did not obtain any embryo, suitable embryo, 31% um, of them did obtain an embryo and uh, practically half of them 15 of the patients who started, 15%, 15% did obtain a, a live birth. So this was the success rate in this uh, poor prognosis group. On the other hand, uh, the other 200 patients who uh, did not want to do try the dual stim approach, they performed the first uh, stimulation, most of them, but then uh, only very few went on on a second cycle. So basically, one could see this huge difference in the dropout. So whereas in the dual team, uh, all these patients, by definition, did complete uh, the stimulation cycle, the first phase and the second phase. Uh, in the conventional arm, uh, there was very few patients uh, who did manage to, to complete a second stimulation and consequently 80% of them did not have a suitable embryo, only 20% had an embryo and out of these uh, less than half did get a pregnancy. So basically the end result is that 8% uh, success rate was increased with the dual steam approach uh, to 15%. Of course, if you look at this infogram, you could see that uh, uh, we're comparing apples uh, with, with oranges. So um, actually to do a thorough comparison, which was done in this small uh, randomized clinical trial actually uh, presented at uh, this month's uh, European um, meeting, the ASHRA meeting. So um, we should uh, actually, in order to do a fair comparison, we should compare two individual, individual stimulation cycles with the dual stim approach. So uh, the Spanish group did this uh, in 40 patients. It's a small trial and only preliminary results. If we look at these, then we can see that there was no difference in uh, days of stimulation, the amount of medication used, the number of mature eggs, uh, elasticist formation rate, the number of euploid embryos. Uh, and uh, the only difference which could be uh, considered significant was that uh, it took uh, with the dual steam approach like uh, quicker to obtain an, uh, this number of euploid embryos than uh, with the conventional approach. Although we could see that uh, these two cycles were not separated too much, probably maybe three weeks, uh, not more. So uh, basically, um, our approach at IVF Spain uh, is quite similar to, to, I mean, quite suitable for the double ovarian stimulation approach. Uh, for any patient who requires low, um, I mean, uh, pre-implantation genetic screening for advanced maternal age or for low responders or patients who have low ovarian reserve markers, uh, we do recommend the embryo banking strategy very strongly. So this means practically to do two to four cycles, uh, in some cases even more, uh, quick back-to-back -back, uh, way. So the gap between the cycles could be zero in kinds of in kind, in case of a double ovarian stimulation approach up to a few weeks or, or, or a month, depending on the patient's convenience. The objective is to obtain uh, ideally four to eight blastocysts, although it's quite a challenge in low responders, but uh, these embryos usually are submitted to pre-implantation genetic testing. And if we manage to obtain a euploid blastocyst, then uh, practically the age factor uh, could be uh, almost uh, fully compensated because we could expect a quite high implantation rate uh, with this uh, patients, at least on a positive pregnancy test level. So <clears throat> a few uh, 
final words about our clinic. This is the headquarters where we do this kind of uh, innovative uh, stimulation protocols. We have uh, three operating centers, two embryology labs, uh, an excellent embryology lab, actually, probably one of the best that I've worked uh, so far. So um, we have time lapse, um, I mean, pre implantation genetic screening. Uh, uh, also, artificial intelligence is uh, investigated for uh, non invasive embryo selection. And most importantly, we have our own uh, genetic department. Uh, so uh, for any uh, PGT testing or more complex uh, endometrial testing uh, or immune system testing, we don't need to send away any sample, we can do it in-house. This is the current medical team, uh, it's quite uh, multilingual because most of our patients are cross-border reproductive care patients. And uh, our group, uh, besides uh, Alicante headquarters where I work, also has a clinic in the capital in Madrid, in the north of Spain, in San Sebastian, and also uh, two branches abroad, uh, one in Germany, in Baden-Baden, and then the, another one in, in the UK, in Manchester. So uh, we would like, uh, we would be happy to, to see you uh, if you would like to uh, try these innovative approaches uh, for ovarian stimulation uh, for low responders and patients who need a pre-implantation genetic screening. So basically that's it. I would uh, thank you, uh, would like to thank you for your attention and hand back to, to Caroline to, for your questions. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you. As always, as I've mentioned at the very beginning, we will, we were having a wonderful presentation with lots and lots of useful details. Uh, thank you, Dr. Padre. It's always great to uh, listen to you and what you have prepared um, for us as well. And uh, now it is time for your questions. Of course, there are some ready and I do see that all everyone is actually kind of typing so <laughs> thank you so much indeed already and before we start there was also a comment that you need to see couldn't agree more that was an impressive <laughs> cv so uh, thank you so much indeed for that comment um okay dr Baudry, let's start with our first question from derek as well with dual stimulation do you see a significant difference during your endo testing combined with stimulation procedures well, um, so as mentioned, uh, if um, if um, uh, the um, question is about like uh, whether we do any kind of uh, endometrial testing during the double ovarian stimulation, usually it's not necessary because uh, because uh, as mentioned, uh, we we are not uh, expecting to do any fresh uh, embryo transfer after double ovarian stimulation, meaning that uh, any embryo that is obtained from these cycles would be uh, transferred at a later stage. So obviously, if um, especially during the second half of the stimulation, uh, taken into account the gene or age effect of the gene or age agonist triggering, then uh, the progesterone uh, exposure after uh, the first phase of the stimulation from the luteinized follicles. So the lining uh, usually uh, is not the same during the second phase. Often there's a menstrual period, which this I didn't mention, but during the second phase often there's a menstrual period, uh, which could be sometimes delayed, uh, comes uh, maybe after the second egg collection. But definitely this is not important because there's no... Uh, uh, fresh embryo transfer with a double uh, stimulation approach. So this is res relevant to, to test the endometrial lining. Wonderful, thanks for the very first question. And let's have a look, more questions are coming in, of course. The question is a bit of a longer question from Karen. I have had a low retrieval rate in previous IVF cycles with only two, three eggs from six, seven follicles. I would like to try a double trigger and have heard this is not possible during the first stimulation of a dual stimulation. Why would this be? Yes, yeah, so this uh, seems to be um, the situation of um, that there may be some issue with the maturation of the follicles because from seven, six, six, seven, six, seven follicles, we, uh, depending on the size, of course, we, we do expect six or seven eggs. So um, double trigger means that uh, beside the GnRH agonist, which is a short-acting trigger, also some HCG is uh, injected. Uh, 
It is true that the publications, what, what Karen uh, has mentioned, it's a very good question that uh, usually in both phases, uh, uh, like only the agonist trigger is used in both phases. Uh, so because HCG, the, the long acting trigger, the, the, the classical trigger has like a half life, uh, which is uh, much higher. So it is sort of not fully recommended or, or could be deleterious uh, if this trigger is used in the first uh, at the first act collection or before the first act collection, in the second one it, it could be used because that would be the, the that will be the last one. But um, actually, um, there are some publications, a Chinese publication, where in both phases HCG was used and they had good result. And even in our uh, clinical experience, although we don't use it often, but uh, we had a few cases, for example, when HCG was used both times or even dual uh, trigger. Uh, so it's not completely sure that if HCG or dual trigger used in the first uh, stimulation phase, that the second uh, stimulation phase, uh, there would be any issue. So I think uh, this uh, could be uh, attempted uh, in order to, to, to try to improve the maturation of the follicles in the first phase and, and even in the second phase. But probably the second phase anyway uh, could give a different number of eggs. So each, each stimulation cycle is different, meaning that if uh, in one phase it was low, still the second phase could, could work. But uh, I think it's not a, not a problem. Thank you, of course. And uh, there is a follow-up, actually, second question from Karen. So let me go straight to that. If the first simulation is suboptimal in comparison to previous IVF cycle, is there typically a correlation to the second phase of double stimulation where it is likely to also be suboptimal? Well, if you look at this, uh, this Poseidon classification, so... Um, I mean, uh, the opinion leaders did uh, devise this classification because um, sometimes there's no correlation. So especially for those patients who don't have low ovarian uh, reserve uh, markers. So for example, um, this Poseidon group one and two patients who don't have low ovarian reserve markers and the low number of eggs is, is an unexpected uh, occurrence, maybe related to a problem of maturation. So in these patients, uh, the second uh, cycle, uh, whether, it's a, whether it's a repeated cycle later or, or a second phase it could, could give actually uh, good results. Um, and uh, if it's a low responder patient, like Poseidon group uh, three or four, so, so if uh, it is expected to have a low number of eggs, even then uh, unexpectedly sometimes uh, one or two eggs more could, could mean a, a difference. So uh, even in these patients, sometimes uh, it's worse to, to definitely try the, the, to do a STEM approach. Again, thank you so much. And of course, there's a thank you from Karen. Great news and thank you from Karen. Thanks. Okay, um, let's have a look. More questions are coming in and here's the next one. Okay, just a second. The first one is here. Do you, we have a few from the very same uh, person. Do you give some do same dose for second simulation or increase the dose? Well, uh, thank you very much, Professor Tan, for the for the question. It's really a pleasure to to be uh, to be seen uh, live uh, by 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 uh, yourself. So, uh, to answer your questions, that I, I see a couple of questions, uh, more technical questions for for, for experts. So, um, sometimes we do increase the dose, probably more like empirically. So it's not. Uh, Necessarily demonstrated, but it, that it has to be increased, or or the or the or, the, um, or that it needs to be increased, uh, but it could be increased a little bit. Yes, yes, or or often we use the same dose. Uh, usually the drugs are not changed. Of course, uh, as you very well know, the endocrine environment is, is completely different uh, with the presence of, of progesterone from luteinized follicles during the second phase. Um, do we? Uh, Going on with, with your other uh, questions, uh, do we use triple or quadruple slim? I think I've used only uh, twice uh, triple stimulation, so it's not often. And uh, I've seen this recent case report of triple stimulation, probably quadruple stimulation. Uh, if it was done, I, I 
had patients like this who did two duo stims, but of course uh, separated a little bit in time. Uh, for example, a 41-year-old uh, uh, patient who, who needed to, to accumulate embryos for a PGT cycle. So it's not uh, four stimulations uh, close, but two double stimulations. So if we could call it quadruple stimulation and the triple stimulation probably is, is also a not frequent thing. And uh, another question, um, do we use GnRH agonist trigger? This is the same question as, as uh, Karen has asked before. So usually we, in, because actually in our clinic, in IPF Spain, the, we, we practically don't ever use HCG unless there's an issue with, with oocyte maturation, uh, obviously only for patients who don't have a risk of OHSS. So we use a lot of, uh, of uh, generic agonist uh, in the, with the dual steam approach, usually both phases are done uh, like this and, and many publications from uh, from Peter Humaydan also uh, advocates the use of generic agonist as a first intention trigger. Uh, but in some cases, maybe we might have used as yes, dual trigger uh, for the second phase, or or if we wanted to improve the oocyte maturation for the second phase, uh, ACG could be also used. Thank you very much, Professor Tran. Thank you indeed. It's really good to see you here as well, and thank you for your questions. And actually, one more. Okay, um, so have you ever published your results, and what is the reference? The results. Well. Um, in, in terms of results, um, myself, I, I, I only have had it in an abstract uh, stage at uh, published at, uh, at ESHRE. Uh, we do use it uh, in our clinic in Alicante uh, quite a lot, uh, but uh, not in a, in a controlled way. So, so it would be like a retrospective result as, as many other Spanish clinics also use it. So it is uh, like gaining in, in, in popularity uh, in Spain and, and other European countries uh, too. But it's it's not published yet because we know that uh, only like thoroughly uh, designed uh, re like randomized clinical trials uh, have a chance of, of being published. Of course, understood. Thank you so much indeed uh, for answering that one. And it's about another doctor from IVF Spain, if you can answer that. Is Dr. Gianna Ispura still seeing patients? Of course, of course, of course. Yes, he's very active and, and, okay. and he, sees, uh, he sees patients, of course. Okay, and, thank you for the confirmation. Yes. Excellent. And uh, one more, actually, okay, from Professor Tan. Can we correspond for more advice? If so, what yes. is your email address? If I, I would can be happy provide to, you to, to provide you Carolyn with the address and and uh, we can uh, we can have a, an, an exchange of, of, of information of course. Wonderful. I can do that. So of course you know where to find me. I will be able to to help you out with that. That's not a problem at all. Um okay, and actually we are just waiting for some more questions. Again, someone is typing, so let's give it a minute and let's make sure that we have answered all the questions. A very interesting session so far. Thank you so much for your uh, questions. And mm -hmm. well, uh, Dr. Baudry, as you can see, there were some comments already. So while we are waiting for the question, as Maybe you see- Maybe I could mention, mention yes. one, uh, one uh, aspect, which, which was not, uh, it's not so much a medical aspect, no, but uh, every okay. clinic has a sort of different approach in terms of pricing, no? Because uh, this kind of dual steam approach, uh, Although it's it's experimental, it 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 has medical indications, but uh, nonetheless, it is uh, uh, as with any uh, embryo banking approach, it is uh, two IVF cycles. So some clinics do uh, this kind of approach that they give an important discount for uh, if somebody tries a second. Uh, stimulation or, or a third stimulation or a fourth stimulation. This is also our, our case at IVF Spain, meaning to um, encourage the patient because uh, the, the cycle is, is hard enough, but if the patient is, is maybe could be motivated a little bit more by, by uh, doing a second stimulation, whether it's double ovarian stimulation or uh, a little bit later, uh, like a repeat, uh, quickly repeated stimulation, uh, this could also be uh, an important uh, factor in, in the decision. Yeah. Thanks indeed. And Karen has one more question. So let me go straight to this one. So I have used menopore before and doctor has mentioned possibly using one LF and menopore for second stimulation. And 42 is the common, as I thought, menopore was the choice of medication in over 40. It is, of course, over over 35, yes. So 
we'll talk about it maybe on Thursday a little bit, uh, like, um, um, I mean, Karen uh, already has, has, uh, has, uh, has the, uh, grasped the differences between the, the two gonadotropins. So sometimes Menopur, which has LH activity, but there are other preparations too. So Pergovarius, which is a, a slightly more expensive medication, but it has recombinant FSH and recombinant LH. This could be useful too. But I think uh, if your doctor has decided to use a combination of gonalef and menopur, then it's a good uh, good um, choice because uh, gonalef could provide a little bit stronger stimulation and menopur could provide additional LH uh, for oocyte maturation. So it's definitely a good approach for the patient uh, above 40. Yes. Amazing. Again, thank you so much indeed. And of course, another thank you from Karen. That might have been our final question. Uh, but of course, as always, remember that you can always get in touch with uh, Ivy of Spain, and I'm sure they will be happy to help you out with uh, lots and lots of details, as well as Dr. Baudry, no doubt here. But as you already know, we will be back with Dr. Baudry on Thursday at 6 p.m. UK time. We will be back. We will talk about uh, medication and some other protocols, so you can definitely join us and, of course, uh, ask your questions. And I I believe this was our final question, uh, question indeed. So thank you so much, everyone. Before we finish, Dr. Baudry, anything else you would like to add? Well, it was a pleasure really, really to, to work again with this very professional platform and, and you, Caroline. So thank, thank you, you so very much. much for bringing up this, this, this topic. Actually, it was uh, your proposition. So uh, I enjoyed it uh, a lot and uh, possibly future webinars too. Definitely, we are already looking forward to it, that's for sure. And as you know, we thank you for that. The wonderful presentation Q&A. I couldn't say anything else really because it definitely was a uh, very um, back and forth kind of um, Q&A session with lots of lots of interesting details as well. So I do believe you found this useful and well, I'm sure it's going to be very, very useful on Thursday. So join us, but before Thursday, Remember, we will be back here tomorrow at uh, this time, 7 p.m. UK time. We will be back with another topic. So hope you will be able to join us as well. And remember, this has been recorded and you will be able to find this on my IV Fences, our YouTube channel or our website. Of course, it will be right there tomorrow. So enjoy your evening. Thank you for your amazing questions. And of course, thank you for this great, great presentation, Dr. Baudry. Definitely wonderful and interesting. Thanks so much and see you on Thursday. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you.